Thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to the Culpeper Chamber of Commerce Town Hall featuring, featuring Neil Mars of Germana Community College. Today's Town Hall will focus on interviewing and hiring coming out of the COVID-19 crisis. This Town Hall is brought to you by our partners, Germana Community College and our Small Business Development Advocacy Council. As we reopen, we realize businesses may be looking to fill positions, and today's speaker has a wealth of information to help find the perfect fit for your organization. Neil is currently an Associate Professor of Business at Germana Community College. He is the lead marketing faculty for the institution, he is also the chairman of the Business Peer Group for the Virginia Community College System. Neil has also taught courses in human resources, finance, and supervision at Germana, and has been at Germana since 2010. In addition, Neil is the president of Solutions Recruiting, an HR consulting and executive search firm he founded in 2001. He works primarily with major industrial service corporations throughout the U.S., helping them optimize their hiring processes and fill high-level and specialized positions. His prior experience includes serving as vice president of sales for RUS, a $300 million industrial services company formerly based in Culpeper along with extensive experience with Fortune 500 companies prior. He has also been a speaker for multiple national and local programs on the subject of hiring and recruiting. Neil holds a master's degree in business from the University of Rochester, New York, and is certified in the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator System. Neil currently serves on the board of directors for Hospice of the Piedmont and is a former board president with 15 years of experience. Neil. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to hearing your presentation today. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for those that don't don't recognize me from that description, I'm also the guy that walks the collie around town every night. So, which is probably where I, probably where many of you may know me. Well, I, th I appreciate the introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit about about my experience, and I'm going to get in to share some information with you. I've lived here. Twenty. I've lived in Culpeper for 25 years, long enough to remember back when the only restaurant choices here in town were Jenner's, Dee Dee's, and driving through. So it's been, I've lived, certainly lived here for a long time. I, I, you've, you've heard a little bit about my experience. I've thought for many years and for a long time that the most important business aspect that we'll all conduct for our businesses, whether we're, we're an owner or a manager, is in hiring people. You know, a good project has a good result. Hiring good people has an exponential benefit. I think that's true at any time, and I think it's I think it's even true more true today than it has been in the past. What I'm going to do is I'm going to now share. Hopefully, I'm going to share my share my screen with you here. Ready? If you would, if you could post page, the third page, please, and let me know whenever that's set. I've got the first page up. So it would be page three. It would have the RUS logo in the top left corner. Third slide, Jeff. Third slide. There you go. Yep. Is that it? Yep. There we go. All right. If that's if that's the slide that's up, and I just showed this, and I won't go back over my experience, but I will talk about a, co a couple of things related to it. In terms of credentials for hiring experience, it's probably two most notable things on there. First of all, for those that might remember, I worked for a company called RUS, which was a $300 million a year industrial services, a uniform company that was based here in Culpeper. It's now Syntas, but it was based here in Culpeper. It was there five years. I was the vice president of sales for that. And during my five years, we went from 75 people nationwide. We had about, in the sales force, 75 locations, and, uh, predominantly in the eastern half of the U.S. We went from 75 sales was 75 to 150. So we doubled the size of our sales organization in the time I was there, which meant we didn't just have to be good at the skill of interviewing. We had to have, have in place the structure and the systems to be able to do it on a repeatable basis and do it well. And we were able to do so while maintaining and growing productivity. I also would tell you that at Solutions Recruiting, I figured the other day that I've done well over in the past 19 years, I've done well over 10,000 interviews. And I'm doing you know, many every week, and I guess the best way to, to, to quantify that is I had a client tell me a couple, you know, a few months ago, was talking about a question that I asked some of the candidates that I sent him. He said, well, that's a really, that's a good way of saying that. And I said, well, you know what? 
scary. I said, if, if you do something a few thousand times, uh, eventually you get the hang of it. So had done, done a ton of interviewing. In addition to that, as I mentioned before, I'm certifying targeted selection and Myers-Briggs. So got a good framework for the discussion. If you could, Jeff, turn to page four that shows the chart. And let me know when you're there. We're there. Okay. What I wanted to do with this is, is I really wanted to quantify a couple of things. And on the left-hand side, you're going to see a line chart that shows unemployment over the past, since 1970 through March of 2020. And what this shows you, this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. None of this is my opinion. This is data. This is showing the average un seasonally adjusted unemployment rate over the past roughly 50 years. And what you're going to see here is that if you look at there should be a circle on the bottom on the bottom right. To put in perspective the job market we just went through, our unemployment has had more months in the U.S. below 4% over the past two years than we've had in the prior 50 years combined. This was record low unemployment. This was a record candidate's market. Now you should see a star at the top right-hand side, which shows about where 14.7% would be, and that's what it was for April. So keep in mind, we went from historic lows to a historic high in unemployment in a month. Um, unprecedented. That's the highest since the Depression. Uh, now, with that said, there's every reason to believe it's going to come back quickly, of course, but it, we've, the market changed. On the right-hand side, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but I also, I'm going to refer to an article in the Wall Street Journal that came out last Friday that talked about kind of the, as kind of the, the tensions that we're all facing as we start to open things back up. And what it talked about was, well, certainly us business people are facing these, te these tensions, that employees are really looking at this with trepidation, that there's a lot of folks that are viewing, first of all, are still unsure about their safety going back to work. And secondly, uh, because of the situation, at least in the short term, there's, there are folks for whom staying on unemployment can be more lucrative than is going back to work. So really, we, we flipped historically to an uh, all-time low to an all-time, or just about an all-time high, change the dynamics of the market, but the people aren't quite ready to come jumping back just yet. Now, Jeff, if you would turn the page, and there should be a page that talks about beware. Do you have that? Yes, we have it. Thank you. All right. One thing before I get into this, too, that I want to talk about with entrepreneurs, it's a challenge, that it is a common stumbling block I've seen with, with, people, with, with other entrepreneurs. First of all, it's really captured, first of all, by uh, a recent book that came out, Malcolm Gladwell. He's a, my favorite author. He wrote The Tipping Point Blink. He does a great job of taking human issues and putting an analytical framework around it to kind of help us think through it. And really what he talked about in talking to strangers was how hard it is for us to make quick judgments on people as humans. And what he talked about, he gave an example of that. What he said, he talked about a, a situation in New York where they took a group had taken a, a, about half a million uh, decision, uh, appellate court decisions over about a 10-year period and evaluated those based on how many of those people, how many people that were convicted in that, or that, in that system went on to commit crimes in the future. And what they did was they, they developed two, two sets of data. One was the judge's decisions, and second was an algorithm, which they used based on a series of criteria that they felt were relevant, and they compared the results of the two. And what they found was the algorithm did a better job of predicting you know, future cr criminal behavior than the judges did. Now, that, now that it, that's staggering. These are people that are literally, their title is judge. They are there and have, submit, if they're a judge in an appellate court, they have tremendous experience. Yet even they will, and the point I want to make here is, will tend to overestimate their gift at reading people with very little information or quickly. We all have a tendency to say, oh, my gut's really good on people. Well, um, your gut it is good, and gut instinct is a positive thing, but you really need to broaden it as much as possible. So if you try to evaluate people on a very narrow field of data, statistically, you're going to struggle with that. And the second thing to remember is that for us, for us entrepreneurs, this business is our life's work. This is what we've, we've 
uh, st strove for for many years, and we view this in a, in a kind of as a higher calling. We have to remember that for our employees, this is still a job, and we and that that's the context in which they're going to view it. Now, Jeff, if you could turn to the hiring process page. Amy's got it. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And really what I want to talk about today is that there are five, in my experience, there are five steps in the hiring process that are important and that, that are all, I will tell you, related to one another. They're all important, and they're all going to have, if you see it on there, very specific outputs that are going to come from them. And it's going to start with, so what we're going to do is we're going to spend time, oh, power's back on. Would, would you like me to, I just, I guess if this lasts for a couple minutes, I can try logging back into the call if you'd like me to. If not, I'll just keep going. I'll just, just keep going, Neil. I think we've got it under control. Thank you for that. Done. All right. I'll keep, I'll keep working this way, then. That's fine. Um, they're all going to have uh, their separate outputs, and they're all going to be important because they're related to one another. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each one. I'm going to define what they mean or what they are. I'm going to give you and talk to you about how they work. I'm going to give you some examples of outputs from each one, specific things. And I'm going to finish at the end with some suggest specific suggestions and tips based on my years of experience on things that everybody here can do to improve the hiring process. So if we could turn to page, the next page that says job design. All set. Just let me know when you got it. All right. All set. All right. Now, first of all, what I mean by job design is essentially think of it this way, is creating a job that people can actually do. And what it means is the definite process of organizing work into tasks and involves effort to organize the tasks, duties, and responsibilities until you know work to achieve your objectives. Now, really, if you think about it, the bottom of the page, so that's the definition. So it's creating, it starts with the design of the job itself. And many times, that's where a position can fail. You've created a position. That's, that's not imminently doable with the, either the people, the resources, or both that you've got in place. And a couple of things. Now, on the left-hand side, those blue boxes are going to talk about the job. There's three dimensions of that. And the first dimension is the job itself. And think of that in terms of, if you look at the comments in between there, you know, what duties is the person going to perform? How much time are they going to spend doing them? And, how, and this is important. Now, how well do they align with the goals of your position? And, and kind of an example of some of the challenges you face, and that sounds straightforward, but there are two that I wanted to talk about. One is back in the day with RUS, the people that worked for me or the people in the sales force were responsible for new business. So that was their focus, and that's how they were evaluated, that's how they were compensated, and that's how they were either retained or not retained was based on their ability to gain new business. What would often happen is, is that because, and, and, and out of, I'm not saying that somebody made a conscious effort to derail this, but something comes up. They've got, a, they've got a service and emergency in a local facility, and they're going to deploy this person to help address that. Now, as a person who many times was able to do it and did a good job of doing it. However, if they do that often, that's a problem. Because if you've structured a job where you're going to have them spending 20% of their time doing managing existing customers, but you're going to evaluate them 100% based on performance against new, you're, you're building a problem right there. Secondly, um, something that might sound, might be familiar though, I saw, read an article in the, uh, a few months ago about a Dunkin' Donuts franchisee that was having a terrible problem with turnover. And when they analyzed what caused it, and it sounds simple, but they, had, they were taking their, their customer service people, the, their counter people, and they were asking them all at the end of the day to spend, and it wasn't a huge chunk of time, but it was a half an hour, an hour, working on mailing labels to send out to, to, to uh, potential new customers. And that, that process turned out to be very cumbersome, and it didn't work. And so what happened was they were losing people, they found, because even though it wasn't a huge chunk of time, it was extremely frustrating. It didn't work. So they were, because they were forcing them to do what seemed like this, this, this you know, mundane task, they were losing people. So they structured the job in a way that wasn't going to be sustainable for long-term success. So that's the job. Secondly, in terms of the job design for the employee, to make sure when you're hiring people that you are matching the job with the quantitative skills that the person ha has, 
and qualitatively in a way that's going to fit. So it's for a way to think of that is, is I've got a job where, where I need customer service skills from people, make sure that I'm, I'm, you know, that I'm not hiring people that say I have an accounting background. And once again, that sounds trite and it's, it's, it's not. Those things happen. Hey, you know what? I know the person has an accounting background, but, and they've done that for 10 years, but we really hit it off in the interview and I think they could do a good job. And I'm not saying they can't. I'm not saying you haven't had tactical experience with it, but the fundamental skills that that person, analytical skills that that person's going to bring aren't necessarily going to match the skills you're going to need them to be successful. And lastly is the environment in terms of creating the job. Is the person going to work in groups so they can have a lot of autonomy or not? Is it going to be a formal versus an informal culture? And are what you're expecting to be realistic? A couple of examples from that are one would be a lot of times I'll talk to people at small companies that say, if I look at that person's experience, they've all, they've all been at big companies and I've worked at both folks and I can tell you that um, in a big company, you have a lot more infrastructure to help you get your job done on the, from a day-to-day -day basis. With a small company, you don't. It's you doing it. So sometimes having, if your environment is, we've all got to pitch in and you've got people who used to work in at big companies, but somebody did that for them, that could be a challenge. And secondly, making sure what you're doing is real, the level that you're looking for is realistic. And many times, I've got one client I work with now, in fact, that has told me that, you know, hey, listen, I want a person that's able to sell to this level of account, but I'm only going to pay them to this level of compensation. That's a challenge. So, so the first thing is job design and making sure that the job you set up is doable and is doable for the people you're going to bring in to, to hire for it. Okay, if there's no questions on that, let's go to page eight, which says marketing. And just let me know when you're ready. All ready, go right ahead. All right, good. That was quick, didn't get a chance to take a sip of drink there. All right, and what I mean by marketing is it is casting the widest possible net to create a large, and I, and I purposely put in the word manageable pool of qualified prospects. So you wanna have phase two is to make sure that you were doing everything possible to have a viable candidate pool to pick from. Because if you don't have that, what you'll end up doing is hiring the best person that comes through the process often versus hiring the right person. Now, the pie chart on the bottom left there is, is the result of a Gallup engagement study. And they've done this for 20 or 30 years. We're going to talk a little, another page or two about more details about that. But this Gallup study breaks employees typically into three groups. And what it says in any, and, it's, and if I think back to corporations that I worked in, if I think to, this, this applies, I think this applies well. First of all, it says that 30, roughly 35% of your people are engaged. That means, and the definition of engagement means that they are expending discretionary effort against their job. Those are the cornerstones. And that, I've seen that number as low as 25 or high, mid to high 20s. That's actually one of the highest levels it's been at in years. So the good news is the, the people were feeling good about their jobs last year. So at 35%, that's basically about one in three are loyal, they're engaged, and they're committing, and they're, they're committing themselves to discretionary effort to, to your job. The second group, which is, over, which is 52%, those are passive, passive employees, which means you know, they're doing their job, but they're not necessarily expending discretionary effort. They're they're doing okay. They're they're there. They're functional. But first of all, they're not necessarily de deploying discretionary effort. And secondly, they're the people that if somebody calls them about another job, they'll listen. That first engaged people, they're not going to listen to other jobs. The passive people will. Now the third category is the people that are actively disengaged, and that's about 13%. And typically that's between, as I said, you know, 12 and 20%. Those are the people, they're working against you. They're, they're out, they're unhappy, they're disgruntled, they're the, on the way out the door. Now, if you look over to the right, if you're gonna conduct a marketing process in this day and age, you're gonna wanna use a tool like Indeed. And I don't know how many folks have used tools like that, but Indeed is, is an online aggregator, which gives you, the as, a, as somebody that's hiring, the opportunity to post jobs. You can also scan resumes. It, particularly depending on the kind of position, that or a career board, I think are, are still a valuable tool. They're not the only one, but they're still a valuable tool. So if I'm 
was recommending to somebody, I'd be using something like it indeed to help attract and find talent because it does help you cast a pretty wide net. Now, the challenge with that, folks, is that that's really drawing from that 13%. You are looking, when you talk on Indeed, you're talking about people that are, that are unhappy and actively checked out and are out there looking for more or something else. Now, the other items I've got on there is, first of all, is on, online, is to look at something like a LinkedIn or a Facebook. And if you are not, if your business is not on LinkedIn or Facebook, it should be tomorrow. This is how, in this day and age, people communicate with one another. This is how people you know, electronically network. Uh, even Facebook is one of the biggest sources of, particularly depending on the positions, uh, candidates for, for companies often. And I will also tell you the advantage of a LinkedIn or a Facebook is that it gets you more looking at that passive group. If I'm on Indeed, I'm, I'm saying, I'm out of here, I gotta go find a new job. If I'm, if I'm on LinkedIn and somebody sees an opportunity for something else, or if they're on Facebook and something happens to hit their timeline, it sounds interesting, they might click on it and take a look. Those are passive people. I like going after those people when I do searches because first of all, there's, there's more of them. There's three times more of those than there are actively disengaged. And secondly, those are people that are likely to be happier doing what they're doing. They're a little less likely to be disgruntled. You know, but beyond that, I, I can't stress enough the importance of networking events like what the chamber does. The more people you can know, the more people you talk to, um, I find the more people I talk to, the luckier I get. So the, you can't really do enough networking. I'm also going to talk uh, at the end of the session about employee referral programs. So step two is marketing and making sure that you're filling the funnel. Right? If you could turn the page to page three, or the page says selection. Let me know when you're there. You're there, Neil. Go right ahead. Perfect. All right. The definition is really that is the process of identifying the best candidates from this marketing process, you know, via the identification and verification of key success attributes. And this is this is this is interviewing. It, but but think of it in an even broader context. And this is remember we talked about at the beginning Gladwell's book. You want to take as broad a picture as possible of people when you're taking them through the step of the process. So if you look at the boxes on the bottom left hand of the page there, it says dimension. Look at the, the, the blue box says the interview itself. And what you want to be doing during the course of the interview is looking for examples of past performance. So if you know that customer service or certain technical skill is important, you want to be asking them questions that will give you examples of that. And that's the old uh, targeted selection or, or, or uh, process, which is, Past performance dictates future behavior. So you're going to want it's behavioral interviews is the term, the general term used for it. But it's it's valid. You want to you get examples of it. So I don't want to hear from a candidate. Well, here's what I would do in that situation. What I'm looking for is, you know, I was faced with that six months ago or a year ago, and here's what I did, and here's how it worked. So first of all, you're going to want to get in the interview process examples from people as well as seeing how more, maybe somewhat less structured, combination of less structured, uh, so how they think on their feet. Ask them something that they may not be prepared for to see how they react. Now, really what you want to get from that is you want to get a more, uh, the, the most objective and broad perspective you can. And I'm going to finish at the end, I'm going to finish with some specific suggestions that, on how to do that that won't take you more time or cost you any more money, but I think are going to help you. Now, the step two would be the process and integration. The interview, it should be a process. You want to have it defined. You want to have certain steps in how it's going to work, and it doesn't have to be long, or it can be long if you want, but it's got to be, you want to have it defined. So it's, you're going to want to have multiple people involved in it, if at all possible. So, the, so it's not just the hiring manager making the decision. Maybe they have an assistant or somebody else is doing that role then, at least to some degree involved in the process as much as possible. So if you can have, you want to have two or three people talking about candidates as opposed to just one. And you want to be able to compare notes and evaluate objectively how everybody felt about the person. So you, once again, your, your desired outcome is to be able to paint the broadest possible outcome and perspective on that category. And thirdly, you want to use from data sources, the more you have, the better. I would, in addition to having more, more people, 
Um, and I know that this is, there. I'm not sure if everybody's completely comfortable with this, but if it's me, I'd look at social media to, to, give, to give me a perspective on that person. And I don't necessarily care if they went to a, uh, a, a, a pub crawl last night. or if, I, I'm not so much concerned about that. What I am more concerned about or, or the politics, I could care less about those. What I am concerned about is are they, are they talking about their prior company? Are they talking about the company they're working at now? Are they talking about their coworkers? I mean, I, I want, if there's something in there, that's another data point that you can use that I wouldn't take it as, as end all be all, but it's certainly it's like having another person there having interview. And secondly, I would call, ask for references and call them. Everybody says, and to a large degree, it's true. Um, you know, goodness, it's, uh, uh, you're going to get people that are going to say good things about them. And that could well be the case, and it's probably likely to be the case. You'd be surprised how much data I can get from people, and I've done thousands of them over the years um, on people that can be meaningful and that can, can add context to that reference. And, and the other thing that I would tell you in a data source is testing. You know, as I, t as I told you, there's lots of different profiles people can take. There's thousands of them. Um, you know, Myers-Briggs is one of the oldest, and so when I'm certified on, there's tons of others. Many of them are good. I do not recommend them as a pass-fail. But I don't think there's any data that says that they work as that. But the best way to describe it is using a tool like a like a Myers Briggs, and there's there's inexpensive or free online tools you can use for those. It's like having another highly respected colleague interview the person. That colleague may know nothing about your business or your job, but it's like having a highly respected colleague interview them and give you their opinion. I wouldn't make it pass fail, but I'd list, I'd sure listen to it. So with that said, there's a number of things that everybody can do to, to make the selection process better. Right? If you could change to the next page that says onboarding, please. All set? All set. Go right ahead. Great. Onboarding. Now, really what this is, is the process of helping new hires adjust the social and performance aspects of their jobs quickly and smoothly. Really, this is, this is probably the best return on investment of the five steps um, in that it's easy to do. It costs virtually nothing. Uh, it, it's highly logical, and it has a great result. And really what that's about is, and I won't go through those steps on there, that present, we'll talk, we can talk more about that another time, but really it's about simple things. It's about when, the, when a new hire starts, having, having the materials ready to, for them to, to the materials that they're gonna need for the job and to ready to use. It's gonna be being clear about what you expect from them. Listen, here's, you're starting your sales clerk here, here's what I expect you to do. You're gonna answer customer questions and you're gonna, just tell them, as well as, as how you're going to evaluate their success. And it's a very simple step that, frankly, most companies miss. They don't tell them. Here's how, I'm going to, here's how what you're going to be evaluated on. You want to give the candidate the opportunity to learn both formal and informal rules about working at your company and, and make them feel like they're, they're a part of the group. I can tell you that... Um, to look at the numbers on the right-hand side, if you can see those numbers, and I've got a couple of data points. First of all, the 151, here's a, here's a statistic for you to look at. So you show that 51% of candidates keep looking after they accept your offer. Now think about that. Half of the people you accept an offer to are going to keep their options open until they start. So it isn't over until the person gets there. Secondly, once they get there, this, depending on the position, this varies, but there's 20, you know, over 20% turnover within the first month and a half. That you can have a lot of time the person's not going to stay. And thirdly, and this is important, this was from a study that was done, this was a few years ago, but it said that there's a 58% greater retention rate for companies that have a formal onboarding process. And it's simple, it's just having their stuff ready for them and, and making them feel well. Right? I'm going to give you, once again, at the end, we'll spend some time going over examples. So if we go to the next page on management, do we know when you're there? Uh, we are there. Perfect. Right. 
we have a definition once again. This is this is engagement. What you want? Studies have been done ad nauseum talking about what that verify that what makes or breaks a company is the percent of engaged employees. The numbers I gave you are averages. Those can be higher or lower depending on the organization. And any meaningful gauge of productivity that you can think of for a company will be driven will be driven by the percent of engaged employees. Anyone you can, any profit, revenue, customer retention, you name safety, you name it, it's tied to engagement. So how do you get engagement? Now I won't go through all these things, but what you can see is those that the Gallup uh, information below that talks about, they've had for probably 20 or more years, and they update it every year, for 20 or more years, 12 fundamental questions that they ask people to, that, that indicate an employee's engagement. And studies have shown that these are the things that people are motivated by in terms of their fundamental satisfaction with their job. Now, I'll point out, they don't, you don't see money on there. And it's not. We, it, when we do a section on management, I can talk more about why. But those are studies have shown time and time again. Those are the twelve things that make people engaged in the workforce. And really, if you look at the boxes on the right hand side, it breaks into three. And this is a gross simplification, but three fundamental buckets. When you hire, when you bring somebody on, you have to make sure that you're clear on what you expect from them. You have to make sure both in terms of explanation as well as environment and culture that those results are achievable. And thirdly, you have to employ needs to feel both recognized as an individual and socialized as part of the company. So if you take all 12 of those things and break them into one of those, generally speaking, one of those three buckets. So it's what are you doing to make sure that you continuously have engaged employees? Now, I would say that because, and that's an important part of the process, is one of the things that I, an exercise that I do with my business class at Germana, is I give them a, a scenario where I tell them that they are managing a call center that has 100 people in it, and their turnover is 120%. And at RUS, we had a call center, and that's not an unrealistic number for, for a turnover, at least at the beginning it was. And one of the things that we make them go to is to do, is to do research and information on what's driving that turnover. And the thing that I want them to take away from that is the fact that if you are not doing this well, managing the people, it's like rowing a boat with a hole in it. You're going to keep paddling, but you're going to spend all your time interviewing and training and onboarding, and you're never going to get any productivity gains. So while this doesn't sound like it's part of the hiring process, it most certainly is, because if it's not doing this well, you're going to be doing that hiring process a lot more often than you should be. So those are the those are the five areas of focus for for management. I'm going to go into some ideas. So if you could turn to page 12 that says ideas, that would be great. But I'm going to pause here for a moment. Probably should have done this earlier and see if there's any questions. Anybody have any questions or comments or or things that they'd like me to to uh, expand on? Nope. Okay, I'll keep going then. Let me give you some. Let me give you some. Based on my experience, let me give you some ideas that I have that everybody can use tomorrow, but I think will help you. And the first one is in terms of the job design, the job description. One of the things that I ask often will ask clients, you know, consulting clients to do is to define success. And I give them an exercise, and I say, all right, let's say it's a year from now, and the employee that I'm about to place here that you're going to hire is a big success. And we're toasting our, our, our mutual positive results. And we're talking about the two or three things that they did that really made them successful. What are those two things? So I make them define what it means. And typically speaking, a job description is going to have a laundry list of 20 things that they want, but there's going to be a couple of things that they there must have. Think about what those are and try to, as much as possible, make them quantifiable, meaning if it's their ability to relate to customers, find a way to quantify that. Maybe it's on sales or issues resolved or time spent. There, there could be a number of ways of doing that. But define what those two or three things are to make sure that they align with what success is, but then you tell the person when they start. 
Now, another thing that you can do to help with job description is talk to your existing employees and say, listen, here are those two or three things that are the most important. Um, have them do a survey and let them, let them do it uh, blind, but have, you know, let them do it confidentially, but say, okay, what, is there anything that you're doing now that's either hindering or helping that? So one of the things that you may get from that is feedback. And you know what? You're having us do, think about that Dunkin' Donuts example. You're having us do these mailers, and boy, that thing doesn't work well, and that sure is frustrating. So from doing that, you can, from doing those things, you can find out things that could potentially, specific to your job, help you structure it in a way that was, that was more meaningful. Now, from a marketing standpoint, in terms of, in terms of filling the funnel, and I, I won't talk about specific general networking results, but that's, that is the number, still is the number one way people find jobs. So how many people, and if you're on the chamber call, you've already bought into that. So I'm not going to focus on that. Uh, you've got to be on, on social media. That's how, particularly if you're hiring younger people, that's how they communicate. So you're, you're also significantly increasing your odds of success because you're going after that engage, that passive category. And there's three times more people in there than there are in the people that are out on Indeed. So you're increasing your odds of success. If you don't have an employee referral program, I, I'd strongly suggest you get one. Something that says one of your best ambassadors of your company can be your current employees and give them a little bonus for give them a bonus for identifying somebody that they think would be good fit. That's going to that's going to be a win-win because they're then going to take a vested interest in making the person successful. So an employee referral program and last but not least from a marketing standpoint if you've got a job, I'd be thinking about, even if it's not today, back in the day, I always used to have uh, people in mind, if I had a turnover in a given position, I always had tried to have people in mind that I might put in it. Doesn't mean it always worked, but I always had in the back of my mind, and I cultivated a relationship with those folks. I may, I may never use that relationship, or I may use it next week. So have a list of people that you think would be really good in that, and try to find a way over time, now that you've got time, to develop a connection with them. So those are some ways to help fill the funnel better. You know, I talked about, you know, the, and this, on interviewing, I talked about, I would definitely have at multiple people involved in an interview process. And I completely understand and respect that in a small business, everybody's wearing a lot of hats. But if there is any way that you can have two or three people involved in the process, I think it adds perspective. The second thing is something that you, everybody can do that I, I do for interviews and I find it helps is that I will have, if I've got an hour to interview somebody, I would rather spend 30 minutes on the phone today and 30 minutes face-to-face -face tomorrow than do one hour of life. Because once again, I want to go back to the point that Malcolm Webb will make it broadens your perspective. I think phone done in conjunction with a face-to-face -face interview or a Zoom interview or whatever, or whatever your circumstances are is a great idea. And a lot of the interviews I do are on the phone because what it does is it prevents you from looking at visual cues. So it prevents you from noticing how well-dressed the person is or are they attractive or does their hair look good or do they look perfect? Because those things aren't really all that important. Or they, they can have a value, but some of these professions can have a value, but you'll get a chance to see that. So I would strongly urge you, if you've got the opportunity, to do, um, even if you've only got an hour to spend, do 30 on the phone, and I do 30 you know, live. Secondly, a question that I ask people, and I can, I'll go into more detail on this uh, if we do a session on uh, interviewing, is I always ask people essentially to tell me about their last job they had. Um, what were the two or three things that made them successful? And as generally things, I know what my client wants, and I'm trying to, from that standpoint, I'm trying to align, and you know what you want, align those two, those two or three things with what you're going to have them do. We also talked about multiple sources on the outside. Onboarding. I think it's a simple thing you can do, but as I said, you have a, if, if they had a business card or if they get a laptop or a phone or, or they get an apron or whatever, or a T-shirt or, gosh, whatever the heck they get, have it ready for them the day they start. I know it can be a lot of effort, but those are the kind of things people make decisions on whether they're going to be loyal or, or just passive or disengaged quickly. 
So the more you can do to just simple thing like that is to convey a sense of purpose and see about what your job and to show them is and to show them that you care about. It. Now I'll also tell you, and this is a tip, and I'll tell you where it came from, but I, this is somebody did for me one time, but I would strongly urge you to, after an employee has been there for a week or two, um, I give them a you know a, a twenty five dollar some type of gift card from Walmart and say, hey, um, you've done a real good job. Why don't you go buy something for your family? Why don't you go get them something? Or or you get or or you get something for a family member. As simple as it sounds, one of the best things that anybody ever did. When I first started, when I first came to Virginia, I was actually working in Toronto, and I don't know if anybody remembers folks remember Steve Lane was the CEO at, at RUS. Um, before I, before I even left my old job, he sent my, at the time, wife flowers and said, welcome to the family. And you know what? 25 years later, I still remember that. That, had, that was probably the best, I don't know what he spent, $50, some number like that, probably the most powerful money he spent on me. It was just something simple like that made the onboarding present, you know, process much more pleasant for me and more memorable. And last but not least, we talked about measuring. We talked about at the beginning, but it happened with measurement, with uh, management. Know what you're expecting somebody to be able to tell it to them. So other simple things like once a week, find a reason to tell your employees something they've done well. Just simple, it's, gosh, it sounds simple, and, and it is simple, but it has such a big impact. I do that with my students. I try to find once a week something to tell them they did well, and and since I started doing it for the past couple of years, I've been amazed at the impact it has. And lastly, one of the things that, that is important and that's always going to be important to candidates is people in their work is flexibility. We've proven over the past two or three months that we can still get work done and be flexible. Maybe some you, you borrow some of that. And what can you do for your employees now to make your pl workplace a more a great place to work and be a little bit more flexible? Now, with that said, I, the, the last page talks about the hiring process. Um, I, I will go through that, and I just I go back over the notes and I talk about potential issues that come that could come from them. I'm not going to cover that today. We'll cover that in other sessions if we need to. But just to summarize, in the last page, there's a page that says summary. There, so the more you can do in in the interview and hiring process to broaden your view on the candidates you're going to talk to, the better. You need to view hiring as not a transaction. It's not about I need to do this part of it or that part of it better. I need to do the process better and understand how the steps are connected to one another. Uh, we're going to have a follow-up, uh, hopefully a follow-up conversation to drill down in any other uh, parts of the process that you guys need. But with that said, um, that's that's the end of my presentation. I'll open the floor up for questions or my contact information is on there. And you know, on behalf of Germana, I appreciate your taking the time to let, let me speak today. Well, Neil, thank you so much. And and when I was looking through it and, and going through it, it really popped out to me to think on your feet. And that's something that we've all had to do due to, the, to this COVID-19 crisis is, is to be able to think on our feet. And I certainly appreciate that. And I appreciate that in our employees and in Amy to be able to, to help us pivot here quickly today and be able to help present uh, your wonderful information. Are there any other questions out there for Neil? Does anybody have Anything they'd like to type in the chat, or if you'd like to chime in now, please, any questions for Neil, uh, we will be able to entertain them now. Hey, Neil, Dave, for, um, I do have really just a quick question, kind of ties back to the process we're using Indeed uh, as part of our process for uh, advertising mm -hmm. openings in our company right now. And, and, and we do, I, I like the concept of multiple people interviewing at different times and, and, and even covering different topics, but, We've kind of put into the requirement for Indeed that they complete a couple of the uh, quick assessment things that are in there. Um, basically, it's a, a phone interview where they add, answer a couple of audio questions and then they show their proficiency technically. Um, yep. And uh, we've had a great difficulty uh, on some levels getting people to do that. Like it, it, we generally make it a rule of thumb if they don't do those two things, we won't even engage them. We, we, we won't even you know, start the process of interviewing because we figure if they can't do what we're asking them to do to apply for the job, then there's generally a, but do you have any kind of an input on that or insight? Is that a bad idea? Because I do sometimes go back through the list of names and I see their qualifications or their resume and it makes me wonder. Uh, yeah, I would say you're, you're probably right, Dave. I, I, I think, uh, I think that's a data point. Um, it, 
Now it would depend on the the um, it would depend on the question and how you're asking me to do it and how complicated it is. Um, if you're saying to listen, I need you to go do a research report and and to to do this, uh, you know that no, that might be. Just keep in mind, you haven't had a chance to talk to them yet and really engage them on the on the position. You haven't had a chance to to sell your company yet, so you can't really ask them to do. You don't want to ask them to do a ton. But to ask them, like, for example, I had a client that that they were hiring couriers. And and one of the questions was, you got to have a, a, you know, a valid driver's license. Do you have a valid driver's license? No. He said, no. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference what else you can do. You can't drive the, be a courier for them. And, do you, and they had to use your, their own vehicle. And is your vehicle at least of this standard? If it didn't work, then, or, you know, they said they don't. They didn't talk to them. Right. So I think if you're asking simple I think once again, simple questions like that. I think it's very valid, but I do. I, I think if it's more complicated, and you're asking to do a lot. Mm, that might be. I don't know. It would depend on the situation. What are you asking them to do? I mean, in a I mean, it, it, it's literally stuff that's built into Indeed. I mean, one of it, you know, is five questions. They it just basically, what are your requirements for salary? What does the commute look like for you? Why this role? You know, just very simple questions to answer. And then uh, there's a, a very simple technical proficiency question like almost like a, a quiz and, and it gives us some insight as to whether or not they've had any any experience in the technical field uh, but it's not by any means a hard it, it's it's very easy i mean the people who take it all you know pretty well show that they've got some competency level on one way or the other but the problem we're having is they don't all even just engage that and so that, I, I think once again, I'd want to look at the specific questions. If you're asking me why your company, to that one, that one I almost, as funny as it sounds, I, you haven't talked to them about why your company yet. So, so that may or may not be. I don't know. It, it depends on the situation. In general, I think they're valid. I think keep in mind where you are in the process, and perhaps you make some of those first call and some of those the second call. But no, I think, I think that's a great way. Those, those types of tools are a great way to do exactly what I was talking about, to broaden your perspective on the candidate. I do something as simple as we're going to have two conversations. Part of it's today and one of the next one is in a day or a couple of days from now. And I do that because I want to see if they can make an appointment. And right, you'd right. Be, you, I'm telling you, you'd be surprised at how if somebody can't make an appointment, how many times the odds are super low that they're going to get through the process. So those right. kind of things tend to be valid. Okay, well... I uh, appreciate this this uh, presentation. It was very informative. I have two phone interviews today, so I'm going to try and apply some of the things you talked about. Terrific. Anything else I can help anybody with? Well, Neil, I'll, I'll ask a question because it was something that popped into my head. I know we have a lot of nonprofits in our in our membership, and is this easily uh, adaptable to volunteers as well? I think it is. I think, yes, you know, as, as I indicated before, I'm on the hospice board, so I'm, I'm also very comfortable and aware of the, of the fact that there are the differences in that type of environment. And if you're talking about a volunteer, really what you need is you, I'd want to understand their connection to the mission. So, yes, I think the basic principles are the same. Understand that you really can't expect some of the same things from a volunteer, of course. Um, you just need to basically understand that, you know, understand their connection to the mission you've got and, and their willingness to adhere to whatever your, your regulations are, what obstacles, I'm going to phrase it this way, what obstacles they would have to being able to support you in those. I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but I think the principles are the same. Awesome. Thank you, Neil. Uh, one last call. Does anybody else have any other questions for Neil? And if we don't have any, I'll give a second to see if anybody wants to unmute. But if we don't have any, we will say thank you to Neil Mars, Germana Community College Town Hall on an interviewing coming out of COVID-19, sponsored by Germana Community College and our Small Business Development Advocacy Council. Uh, I think it was a great success. And a lot of great information shared by Neil. And as he said, we're going to have him again, hopefully, and we're going to work with Neil to uh, drill down on some of the more intricate 
things uh, on his presentation. So, Neil, thank you again. We appreciate you coming on board today. Thanks for having me. And hopefully, we'll have I'll have power next time for the entire session. So that would be that would. Be fun. Right. It, thank you. It's you. always something, and so thank you for being able to to be flexible with us. We appreciate that. Okay. No problem. All right, take care. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Enjoy your weekend.